Hebrews chapter number 11. I started this, and I know that Sunday mornings is usually not the most favorite time to do this, but I'm gonna start, I, I told you last week we're going to start going through and preaching theology and teaching at least about God, and theology about God and who he is and what he is. I'm doing that because a lot of people today, and, and especially independent Baptists, they have a really twisted view of God, and the reason why they have a twisted view of God is because it's never been taught. I grew up learning theology from my parents. My mom and dad set us down, taught us who God is, taught us about the doctrines of God. I was raised in a good Christian, a good independent Baptist church, a good uh, Baptist church that taught the things of God that was right on, you know, taught, taught through, and, and they weren't right on everything they believed in some secondary doctrines that I at least, I disagree with them on secondary doctrines. And, um, I grew up in a good church, but when I went to college and I went down there to be, a, went down there, I wanted, I need, I need to get away. I, it was a long story, but I need to get away from my house and get, a, get away from where I was at. And I needed to get down to, to go to college. And um, they said, okay, you need to go, in there, go down there with an open mind. Go down there with an open mind. Don't think you got on like you know everything. Go down with an open mind. They went for the first two years of college teaching stuff I learned in kindergarten teaching stuff I learned about in primary school. And by the way, Bible colleges, for the first four years, your bachelor's is very generic and basic. You're not going to learn very much deep stuff in Bible college as much as you would learn from reading your own Bible, going to your own church, going to a good church that preaches the word of God. You'd have a better foundation by going to your church than anything else. They really start getting into deeper nonsense in seminary. Otherwise, Bible co- don't get me wrong. The Bible colleges I've been to, the Bible college that I went to, for the first three, four years, they scr- barely, they didn't even scratch the service on theology. And so I was down there. I was eating everything I came across, and I was bored half to death because I wasn't being challenged or stimulated. I wasn't being challenged to grow. So um, learning theology is important. You shouldn't have to go to Bible college to learn theology. In fact, if you're going to Bible college, it's, you already, already know theology. You ought to learn theology by reading your Bible, by praying, by listening to preaching, absorbing preaching, everything you do about preaching. So, you know, learn it. Learn from the teachings of God's word. Study for yourselves, okay? Hebrews chapter number 11, and we're going we're to read verse number 6. Verse number 6 is our text verse here for the, for the thought. We'll get into some other text, down, you know, some other verses in a couple weeks. But it says in verse 6, but without faith it is impossible to please him, who, God, okay? Verse five, it says, by faith, um, um, that Enoch have was translated by faith that he should not see death, and it says that he pleased God. So without faith, it's impossible to please God, okay? To please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So we talked about that last week, how you need to know that God exists. There is a God. We talked about that last week. I'm not gonna review all the points, but you have to believe that he exists. You have to understand there is a reason that he exists. You got so, we, go, we go out so many all the time. We come across people, well, I just have faith. I got faith. Well, what do you have faith? Well, I got faith in God. Really? Well, what, t- explain to me your faith in God. How can I go to heaven? Well, it's, you know, it's changes in person. To person. It's, up to, it's up to you. It's up to how you. No, it's not. It's up to God. It's how God does it. It's what God wants. So we talked a little bit about that last week about God is. God exists. You have to understand that God is a creator, that he exists. But today I want to talk about a little bit more about this, about what God is. Now, don't get me wrong. I know that God is a person, okay? God is a who. He's not a what, okay? God is not a statue. He's not a dog. He's not a tree. He is a who. God is a who. In fact, turn your Bibles over there to Daniel chapter number three. Keep your place. You know, you can just go to Daniel chapter three. Genesis, Genesis, Exodus, skip a lot of books, go to Daniel. Daniel chapter 3, look at verse number 15. So here's the background of the story. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were, were you know, they're, they're, Hebrew, they're Hebrew children. They were, they were brought in captivity. And while they're in the captivity, the, the king decides, you know what, I'm going I'm to have a celebration. I want to make a golden image to myself. I want to make myself, you know, worship myself. It's going to be huge. It's going to be bigger than anything else you've ever seen. It's going to be huge, all right? So he's all excited about it. And then it says in verse number 15, now, if you be ready at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, um, harp, 
sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made. Well, but if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And what is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? No, the Bible says, who? Even the world know that God exists. Even the world knows that there is a person, there is the existence of an almighty being that is God. The world even understands that. The world grasps that. The world even, here's Nebuchadnezzar, he knows there's a God. He knows that God is a, is a who, not, a, not just a what. Now go to, go to um, John chapter number four, if you would. Go to John chapter number four. John's in the New Testament. If you have a Schofield reference Bible, I feel sorry for you. <laughs> John chapter number 4, verse 23 and 24. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father. That's a male, right? That's a male, right? Okay. The Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Okay, go to Exodus chapter number 20. Exodus chapter number 20. When we examine even casually what God's word says about God, we can see two main categories of God's being. Okay? This isn't one of this is this is um, a common sense that God is a being, that God is a that God is a spirit. He does not have a physical body. When it gives references in the Old Testament or New Testament, talk about the hand of God, the heart of God, the eyes of God, it's anthropomorphic, anthropomorph anthropomorphic, it's just a it's just a it's a um it's referencing, like, okay, the, the hand of God is moving. God is a spirit, okay, and, his, and he doesn't have a physical human body like we have. God is a spirit, okay? So God is a spirit. So when we look at that, we understand, though, that God is the Father. He is a male form. He is a male spirit. He's not a female. He's male, okay? And before we go any further, there's no such thing as Mother Earth. Just throwing it out there. Sorry, Captain Planet. There is no such thing as a... Mother is Mother Earth, okay? There's no such thing as Mother Nature, okay? There's not Father God and, and Mother Nature, there's Father God, okay? In Exodus chapter number 20, God is speaking here about to the children of Israel, and he makes it perfectly clear that he does not want to be associated with a statue or a graven image because people are prone to worship something they can see rather than what they can't see, something they can control rather than what's supposed to control them. Understand the difference? So God is telling them, do not have idols, don't have idolatry, don't have graven images, have nothing above me because he wanted you know, nothing equal to me because he wanted to be first and foremost in their mind. And really, he wants to be supreme in their mind. And Jesus tells that ultimately in the New Testament that it's not just our, our, our mind, soul, and strength, but it's even our heart. Okay, our body, soul, and strength, but it's also our heart. God wants first place and primary in all that we have. In Exodus chapter number 20, the Bible says, and God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee, unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down, bow down thyself to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. So that, tr that tree is not, that tree, that, uh, a statue is not. A statue can't say, I am that, or I, I am means self-existent one. I am that I am, the self-existent one. Exodus chapter 3, Jesus, God says, I am. Well, who should I say, you know, shall send me? Moses is asking God, who shall I send, who shall I say, or he didn't say, what should I say? He says, who should I say is sending me to Egypt to say, let my people go? And God said, Tell them unto them that I am. I am that I am. I am the self-existent one. I am had sent me. All right? So every time you find God in the Bible, he's, he's, he's a real person, and he's a spirit. God is the Father is a spirit. No man can come up unto God 
but by Christ he is a spirit. Okay? Now go to Bible to Hebrews chapter number one. Hebrews chapter number one. Hebrews chapter number one. God, who at sundry, again, God who, not God that, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds who being the brightness of his glory and the expressed image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So the Bible says he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. I was talking to a guy yesterday, and he was like, I know Bible. I know more Bible than you. I said, well, toot, toot, good for you. Let's go to Bible Jeopardy and see what we can get a million dollars. And he was like, you know, he's like, yeah, I know more Bible than you. I said, well, good for you. I'm glad you know more Bible than I. I said, by the way, did you know God is left-handed? God does everything with his left hand. He goes, no, I never read that in the Bible. I said, well, it's true. It's absolutely true. He goes, where? And I read him in this passage. He goes, it didn't say God's left-handed. I said, well, how can he do anything if Jesus is sitting on his right hand? It says Jesus is sitting on his right hand. And he goes, I never read that before. I'm like, oh, man. So much fun. So anyways, but it says here, but it says here that Christ or that Jesus is the express image of his person. So again, it tells us that God is a person. He's not a human being. He's a spirit, and his spirit is a person, okay? There's the Father, there's the Son, and there's the Spirit. We know that, and we'll get into that in a couple weeks down the road, I'm sure. But God's nature is this, okay? To understand that we understand about God and his nature, there comes with two Two main, two main um, venues, two, many, two main categories of God's being, of who he is. We're going to try, get, we're going to get into this as the next couple weeks. It's theology on Sunday morning. I know it's totally crazy to do this, but it's okay. We look at, there's God's nature, and then there's God's attributes, okay? God's nature, and then God's attributes, or character. Someone said this, to, to know his nature without his character is like, is like knowing a machine that is capable, that, what is, that is capable but without purpose or design. It's like having a machine that is able, capable of doing something, but not knowing its character or design. That's what we do when we come to God and we have an understanding of God's nature without his character. The nature is this. It's one's involuntary attributes. The nature or natural attributes is involuntary, something they can't control. Take your Bibles, go to um, Proverbs chapter number 31. There's a reason why we don't have a picture of what God looks like. A couple weeks ago, I was, down in, I was down in West Virginia for this preacher was preaching. I want to be a blessing to my friend. I was trying to be a blessing to him, and this preacher is up there preaching, and he was a guest preacher. And you walk in the auditorium, they had sissified Jesus all hanging over the wall, and this, the, they had a great big mural. I mean, this mural, they'd pass it like, like Stephen Anderson's wall, like, like pygmy. This thing was like literally probably like twice as long as this wall. And it was this great big garden scene, and here's Jesus, you know, the, you know, the garden of, you know, the garden where he rose from the dead. And there's Mary Magdalene worship, and Jesus is looking like this sissified, just effeminate looking, just gross. And it just turns my stomach when I see it every time I see that, because I'm like, it looks, Jesus is a long, Jesus is a long-haired sissy freak. Now, I don't know, I don't know exactly what he looked like, but I can tell you that he was not some blue-eyed, Ang, you know, English looking, he, you know, he wasn't some, the Bible, no, I, he wasn't some effeminate looking long haired sissy freak either. I mean, think about this. When Jeff Owens preached this one time in a sermon, I loved it. He was like, when, when Jesus came, when Jesus went to call the fishermen, he wasn't like, yoo-hoo, fell off, yoo-hoo, take up your cross and follow me, fell off. And I was like, that's not how Jesus came across. He was like, hey, leave everything you got, forsake your nets, come follow me. They're like, man, something's about that guy. That guy's got power and authority. He speaks as no man ever has. He, hand, he speaks as one his authority, not like the scribes and Pharisees. This guy, this guy's got power. Jesus endured all the pain and suffering that he endured before the cross 
being whipped with a cat, you know, being whipped 39 times, say, you know, 40 times, save one, being being beaten, being massacred, having a crown of thorns beaten to his to his head, dragging a heavy a heavy cross up Golgotha's hill. He did that after being beaten, being up all night, being tortured. I'm sorry, I can't even do that. I get a paper cut, I'm about to call it quits. But that's not what Jesus did. Jesus was not just a weak-minded thing. Jesus was a man. Jesus was manly, okay? But, so I have a problem every time I see that, but I have a problem even worse is when we try putting God to a, to a cosmic being. We try making God to something we can see. Ever see everyone ever see It's a Wonderful Life? I mean, it's classic. It's got this bright, this bright being, this bright cluster of stars. Joseph, Joseph, call for Clarence. And here comes a star. And you called? And it's like, it's like we, we had a picture of God as some cosmic idea or cosmic understanding or some, some deep alien voice. We don't know what God sounds like apart from his word. We don't know what God looks like, but we do know that Jesus is the express image of God's person. Jesus is the express image of God's physical person in the human body, okay? Proverbs chapter 31. Let me, see, let me see if I can find my verse. Verse number 30, Proverbs 31, verse 30. Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth God the Lord, she shall be praised. Now, what does that have to do with God? Well, here's the thing. We, God's, God's nature is something that he has got no glory of himself. It's like it's natural, okay? I don't look at my wife and say, man, my wife has got the most cutest nose, I don't praise and glory her physical attributes because her physical attributes, they come involuntary. It's something, something that she can control. Aisley, my little Aisley here, she's got the cutest laugh. And when she gets, when she gets to going, she's got this evil gremlin laugh. I mean, it's like, <laughs> and it's, she can't control that laugh. It comes involuntarily. Ever, hear something, ever, ever see someone who's got like a hiccup? So they have involuntary. It's not that something they choose to, I'm going to start hiccuping. <laughs> It's involuntary, okay? It's something they can't control. When we stop and look at the things of God, it's not something of his nature. It's not something of his character. It's something of his nature. Understand what I'm saying? So there's things about God that's his nature. We can still thank God for. We can admire them, but they're not praiseworthy, okay? There's things that are not praiseworthy. And I'm, I'm not saying we shouldn't praise God that he's eternal. I'm saying that we should understand that that's not his character, that's his essence. That's his being. That's who what he is. And I don't mean essence like the other people say it. That's what he. That's what he manifests. That's how he is. That's part of who he is. That's his nature. That's what's there. Okay. Um, the Bible says beauty is vain. It's supposed to be admired, not praiseworthy. It's appreciated, not praised. It's when a person can't help. It's when it's uncontrolled. Okay, like me, for instance. This, you guys should not come to me and want to you know be around me because I'm I'm like Mister. Mr. October, I don't know, look at me because I'm my, my physique, okay? My beauty, my physique. Jeff always, gets, Jeff always gets harassed about this. There's one guy in particular as a preacher. He's always trying to talk about how Jeff is better looking than he is. And he's always talking about Jeff's looks, and Jeff's like, seriously? You're creeping me out, man. <laughs> well, Jeff's just better looking than me. He's like, well, please, just leave me alone. What is your problem? But, um, but it's not something you can be appraised. It's something you can appreciate it for your physical looks. Now, if you go and start bench pressing, Okay, you start bench pressing to make yourself, okay, some people do it because they want to have inner strength. Some people do it because they want to be buffed up. They want to be bodybuilder. Well, for what? Because they're insecure about themselves and they're trying to make themselves look good. You're, when you're trying to do that, you're, it's vain. It's vanity. When you're trying to do it for looks, it's vanity. That's what the Bible says. It's, it's, it's something you're trying to do from your outward appearance. Let the real you be there. That's why plastic surgery, look, I, I'm thankful for some people getting plastic surgery. I understand some people have different things going on, but your nose is perfectly fine the way it is. Your ears, they're not too big. Who cares if you can fly, Dumbo? Your ears and your nose are just the right size. That's why God made you, right? <laughs> but the things that God wants us, that was a little pop culture for everybody, okay? But um, there's, that's how God made us. You know, well, I need a tummy tuck. Well, fine, you want to get a tummy tuck? Whatever, but if, but if it's to... If it's for vanity reasons, you know, if it's health reasons, is one thing. For vanity reasons, it's another. You don't do things for vanity reasons, okay? That's not the reason why you should do these things, to make yourself vain. Um, but, you know, it can't be controlled. In fact, go to, go to 1 Timothy chapter number uh, 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3.
Oh, come on, Tim. Chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 2. Even in how we dress, we can be putting on vanity. Even what we do, even ladies, when you do your makeup, it can be for vanity. Guys, when you sit in there for 20 minutes and you're in front of the mirror trying to do your hair, it's for vanity. Just shave it all off. It'll be okay, right? That's my next step. Look at this, this is verse number nine. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. I've got this, this my, I got a preacher friend of mine. He's re, he reads a book and he kind of puts out snippets every day and he emails a bunch of people, Christians, about, you know, full-time Christian service. But anyways, they're going through a book right now by, by, the, by Mr. and Mrs. Vaughn. I forgot their names, their, their names are Vaughn. And it's about modesty. And it says that a woman is willing to flaunt herself openly with the clothing that she wears. She is screaming, look at me. Look at me. That's not godly, that's vanity. It's vanity of mind. You're screaming to be looked at. You're screaming to have attention. Some people dress away because they don't know any better. But for those who willingly dress immodestly and willing to dress provocatively and willing to dress to cause attention and draw attention to yourself, look at I'm telling you what. I'm th- I, I, I'll tell you what I notice. I notice the woman who's dressed like she's like a streetwalker, okay? And then I notice some women who are dressed in a, in a dress, modest apparel, shame face, not, ex- not exorbitant hair, not Tammy Faye with all the makeup, not looking like the clown, you know, looking like Bozo the Clown with the makeup chiseled on their face. I notice the woman who's dressed modestly. I notice the woman who's dressed appropriately because she's doing it for the right reasons. And I don't really pay attention to the street walking person out there. You know what I'm saying? I have more respect and I'm drawn more to that beauty of properly dressed than I am towards seeing what's on... And what is with, I was, I was and I'll, I'll just say this real quick. I was looking, so I had a friend, a friend who was doing a wedding for someone last week, and they had a picture of the bride, and the bride had nothing, like nothing was, not, everything was, every, you could see, you could see too much. What is, let me tell you something, okay? When you're wearing a white dress, walking down the aisle, and guys, pay attention to this. Ladies, pay attention to this. When you're walking down that aisle and you're getting married, let the husband be surprised when he sees you. Keep yourself covered. Why? I don't understand. These women pay millions of dollars for a low plunging dress or a high, or a high slit or a, the back is empty. The back is gone. Why would you cover yourselves up? Be modest. Be, be, have a mystery about you. Have a mystery about it. But it's like every, you get married and everybody can see what the, what the groom is about to get. And I'm like, Seriously? That's gross. That's wrong. It's, it's wicked, okay? But the Bible says in, in 1 Timothy chapter 2 that women are supposed to adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. We shouldn't wear clothing that says, hey, look at me. I've arrived. All the guys, look at me. You know, you know you've seen that girl in high school. And she's like got to be the center of attention. It's always got to be about her. It's not with meekness. It's, not, it's always trying to get the most attention. That's not what God does not want us to think about his physical being. God wants to know his character and his mind, who he is. Okay. So having said that, let me go to some things we can look about. First about, about God's nature, about what God is, the, the nature or the 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 nature, the physical attributes of what God is, the natural attributes of God, okay? These are things that God cannot change. It's what he is. In fact, the things that he has, these, these, natural, these natural attributes are held in check by his character. Understand what I'm saying? The natural attributes that he has are held in check by his character. What he is is controlled by who he is. If I can say it that way. Go to Matthew chapter number 28. Matthew chapter 28. Verse number 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. He says, All power is given unto me. I have all the power in heaven and on earth. It was given to him by God the Father. He has all the power, 
all the authority because there's death, burial, and resurrection. He's got all the power, all the authority. Philippians chapter 2, he has all the power. He is all-powerful, okay? So we stop and realize the things about God. He is omnipotence. His omnipotence means all-powerful. And go to Isaiah chapter number 44. Here are just some verses. I'm not going to go super deep in the passages because we can find it in just a couple of passages that we can keep on finding as we read our Bibles. But just for overview of the doctrine, I want to go to it. Isaiah chapter number 44 in verse number 24. Are we there? Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. No one had to help me with creation. I did it all by myself. He is all powerful. He didn't need a phone a friend. He didn't need to pull the audience. He didn't need a double, a double, you know, a double chance. He was able to do it all by himself, okay? He doeth all things well. In creation, he was omnipotent in creation. Go to Jude chapter, go to Jude. It says there's only one chapter, so go to Jude, and you'll see how, it, how he's all powerful in salvation. Now, I was talking to a guy yesterday, and, uh, Ever, ever talk to someone and you're not too sure, like, you know, you're the conversation, you're talking to him, and he says he changed, you know, they said they changed their mind what they believe, but at the very end, he kind of resists and he builds up that wall of resistance. And even, even though he admitted he changed what he believes and he believes what you're saying, he has to go back and hold on to the past, but he realized everything he's believed until then is vanity. And he realized the cost, and he chose not to. He chose not to accept it. He chose to. He understood what I was saying, but he chose to reject it and hold on to himself. Well, you mis you misunderstood my question. You said that a person has to believe in the Lord and maintain a good life in order to keep in order to have eternal life. He goes, "Well, yes, I just showed you otherwise." Well, yeah, I understand what you're saying, and I believe what you're saying, but I think you misunderstood me. I said, "No, I'm pretty sure I understood what you're saying." You're saying I have to maintain my salvation by good works. You're saying it's salvation by grace through faith plus works. That's what you're saying. And it's not what God says. And I showed him everything I could. And at the end, he was flustered. And I said, okay, I'm backing off. God doesn't need our help in salvation. What God does need is for us to submit to the righteousness of God. Okay? So Jude chapter number, Jude 1 verse 24. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God and our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forever. Amen. God doesn't need our help to maintain our salvation. I'm going to say that again. God does not need our help to keep us saved. I'll say it. Let me say this again. Woo, go right. I said, God does not need our help to keep us saved. And all the redeemed said, okay, that's what I was hoping for. Don't go meet. I listened to a camp meeting preacher on the way home last night, and he was going off on a tangent about, what you're going to do with that old you? Did Jeff, did you listen to it? Oh, come on, man. It was, it was classic. But um, in salvation, he doesn't need our help to keep us saved. He's able to do it by himself. He's that powerful he's omnipotent his power is above all go to john chapter number 10 john chapter 10 how do i know that benny hinn is of the devil how do i know that benny hinn is of the devil let's read in verse number 17 john chapter 10 verse 17 Therefore doth my father love me, because I laid down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down myself, that I have power to lay it down. I have the power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my father. Look at verse 25. Jesus answered them, I told you and you believe not in the works that I do. Sorry, go to John 11. Sorry, John 11, 25. This is what I want. He says, I, I have the power to raise myself from the dead. I have the power to be, to be resurrected. I don't need anybody's help. I don't need Benny Hinn to come. I don't need someone to raise me from the dead. 
How do I know? Because he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Look at verse 25. Jesus saith unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the resurrection? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is able to raise himself from the dead? Do you believe that God alone, that God, the triune God alone has power to raise from the dead? Yes. Our faith doesn't raise us from the dead. Our faith in him, our belief in him that did raise us from the dead, that made us walk again, that's what saves us, okay? We don't have to, you know, God, God is the one. God is the one that raises us from the dead. He is all-powerful in resurrection. Go to Psalms chapter 147. Psalms 147. Psalms 147, praise ye the Lord, for it is good to sing praises unto our God, for it is pleasant and praise is comely. The Lord doth build up Jerusalem. He gathereth together the outcast of Israel. He healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. He telleth the number of the stars. He calleth them all by their names. Great is our Lord and of great power. His understanding is infinite. God is powerful in understanding. He's all powerful in understanding. He doesn't need an encyclopedia. God doesn't need Google or Bing. God doesn't need us to tell God what he needs to do. God is unchanging. God is omnipotent. He alone, and these are just some areas, but these are just things that God is. This is what God does. There are other attributes that we can study about the nature, about God and his physical nature of what is immutable. He cannot change. This is what his body, this is what, his, this is what, he, is, this is what he is made up of, his omnipotence. He is all-powerful. He doesn't need an assist. There's not a, by the way, he doesn't need a second mediator. The Bible says there's only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. I'm sorry, but Mary is dead and gone. She's with God in heavenly places, just like all of those who are dead in Christ. Is. She was not a perpetual virgin. She did sin. She wasn't immaculate. She's not the mother of God. She was the mother of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. She is not a perfect person, and she does not mediate for us on our behalf. And all those who worship Mary are worshiping a false idol, and God says that he's got nothing to do with that. The Bible says he alone is worthy of praise. He alone is worthy of honor. He alone is the Savior, and he don't need mortal woman helping him out or mortal man. That takes care of the Catholics. I was trying to be, I was trying to be polite how I put it down there, but yes, sir. That's exactly right. And you don't need some pope on a rope and a dope sitting back in a box, listen to us, confess our sins. Only one can forgive us our sins, and that is Jesus Christ the righteous. Having said that, I've got low esteem for Catholics, all right? For the, for the Catholic doctrine, I've got low esteem for them. But they're sneering millions and hundreds by the score, and people are dying and going to hell, believing their good works and their sacraments and their baptisms and their bingo and all the things that their raffle tickets and their all the things they're trusting in it. Can I tell you, the only way to get to heaven is through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. The only way to get to heaven. And millions of people by the day. And I'm sorry, just because they call themselves Christians, the Catholic Church is not Christian. Go to the average Catholic Church and ask them if they're Christian. They said, no, I'm Catholic. Then why do we lump them in as Christian? Can I, let me just go a step further. Let me, let, me, let me be a little bit more politically controversy. Notre Dame, the, the church at Notre Dame was not a Christian church. I don't care if they had Jesus on the cross. Newsflash, Jesus is risen! He's not stuck on a cross somewhere, and anybody sits down and worships a dead Jesus on a crucifix denies the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and can't get saved. Until they believe that, they can't get saved. They got to believe that Jesus rose again. That's the gospel. 
I heard a Baptist preacher. Well, I don't see the, I don't see the importance of his burial and resurrection because on the cross, Jesus said it is finished. On the cross, Jesus said it is finished because he became sin for us who knew no sin, that we may be made, we may be made the righteous of God in him. He took upon our sins and he went to hell and he paid for our sins in hell. And the Bible says that he rose again the third day. He paid for it all. And these false religions out there, it teaches you got to maintain good works, you got to repent of all your sins, you got to jump through this hoop and that hoop and that hoop. Jesus said plainly, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man that cometh unto the Father but by me. You can't get any more plainer than that. He doesn't need help. There are other, there are other natural attributes that we'll look at in, in the weeks to come, and I'll give you some of them right now. His, he's infinite without beginning or ending. He's eternal. Okay, he's eternal, infinite, with no beginning and no ending. Animals have a beginning and they have an ending. Man has a beginning and has no ending. His soul lives forever somewhere, either in heaven or in hell. Okay? It's no eternal soul sleep. A person doesn't die in hell and becomes annihilated. That's all wrong in a doctrine, too. Someone burns forever in a lake of fire for all eternity if they don't have Jesus. That's the Bible. Okay, so man has a beginning, man has no ending. Angels have a beginning and have no ending. God has no beginning, has no ending. He's always been. God doesn't have a birth, he's always been. So God is infinite. He's without, he's before creation and after time, he'll always be God is. Okay, that's the, that's the eternal, that's, it's, that's the, called the infinite or the eternal being of God, okay? There's the triune and the fact he's a trinity. There's the father, there's the son, and there's the spirit. They're not inferior one to another. They are one. They're equal, okay? Co-equal, co-eternal, co-existent. There's the omniscience of God. That's all-knowing, that God is all-knowing. This is where Kelvin is kind of gonna, on a fun point on that one, but he's immutable. He cannot change. It's impossible for God to change. He's self-existent. We kind of talked about this, but he's self-existent. The fact that he didn't have anybody create him, he doesn't need anybody to sustain his life, he sustains his life by within himself. He's self existent all right and then we talk about he's he's supreme or i'll use the term i'll use the word supreme he's supreme he's got pepperoni cheese all right he's supreme and then we'll look at this last one it's um he's omnipresent he's 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 omnipresent he's in all places and we're going to look at those things these these doctrines are the natural attributes of god they cannot change okay he has now he keeps these natural attributes these natural attributes in check by his character okay so that's why you say well you know it's the not the, the things that's what that's why the bible talks about so little does the bible talk about our physical appearances that's why the bible is so little about our about our how our body looks he talks about tattoos. He talks about scarring up our bodies. He talks about abusing our physical bodies with mankind. But our physical bodies, that's not the thing. God cares about the inward man of the heart. The things that we're going to be judged by is who we are, how we're manifested, our character. That's why the book of Proverbs is listed so fervently about what's inside. We always hear what's inside that counts. Well, it's true, but it also manifests on the outside. Okay? A person who's trusting God, they're not going to be greedy. A person who's trusting the Lord, they're not going to be giving themselves to lust. A person who's godly is not going to be the ones who are going to be caught up in, in snares. We all, have, we all have besetting sins, but those are the things we're supposed to get rid of in our life. But to be more like God, the, the, na the, na the natural attributes of God, of who God is, or what God is, how he, how he demonstrates in his natural form, his natural being, these are the natural attributes and they're kept in check by who he is personally. Understand what I'm saying? If you're clear, raise your hand. If I made myself clear today, raise your hand. If I'm, if I'm not clear like cement, raise your hand. Perfect. All right. That's what I've got for this morning. It's just about, it's just about 12 o'clock. I think it's two minutes to spare. Let's ask God's blessing on our time of fellowship. Thank you so much for being here today. Before, let's have everybody, every head bowed and every eye closed. Before we go to prayer, I want to ask this question.